All righty. All right. Uh, 316, one minute late. Apologies. Here we go. We're going to watch a, a little bit of college film today. So this is going to be Stanford versus Lewis. Uh, this was actually the last match played in 2020 um, before everything got shut down. Um, this is a good match. There's a couple of good uh, – a couple of things that happened during this match that I think uh, we can take away take, – take some lessons from. Um, and we'll talk – I won't ruin any surprises, so we'll talk about them as they come up. Uh, but just a little background. Um, there's a Beta Bay player on this – in this matchup. So Kyle Bouget – um, an outside hitter for Lewis. Um, he is the, what is he, number eight, I believe. He's the really buff looking guy with the black uh, tattoo that goes around his arm like this. Um, that's Kyle. So he's, he's playing at North Cal um, for the first time in his collegiate career. He's, he's the senior in this uh, and his last time. Uh, Lewis ends up winning this match. I will tell you that but we'll just get a little overview of kind of how things went. This is night two. So Lewis won um, the previous matchup the night before, also at Burnham Pavilion um, in four sets. Um, and kind of had a little, Stanford had a little bit of a tough run, um, in the, specifically in the final two sets, some opportunities that kind of just didn't go our way. Uh, and therefore, uh, you can kind of see what the talk was beforehand, and you can see how Stanford comes out uh, in this match. So. We'll hop right into it here, get to the share screen. And we'll start. Stanford serving close to us. Uh, they're starting in row two for Lewis. Lewis has some really good middle blockers. Uh, Kyle Bouget, the Beta Bay uh, alum, is the front row outside hitter in this one. So here we go. You'll see a lot of middle action for Lewis, specifically uh, this guy that's in right now, uh, Tyler Mitchum. Super good, um, athletic, all-around smart, smart middle blocker. Really completed <laughs> on my end, uh, Matt. I'm not sure about the pixel. Yeah, I don't know about the rest of the guys. Okay. Let's see here. Let's see if I can. Anything else? Stop mine. Anyone else want to throw a comment in there? Is it uh, is it pretty bad for anyone? It's like I don't know. the video itself is kind of smooth, but like it's super, like the picture is super pixely. Yeah. Interesting. I'm gonna let it play for a little bit. If it gets, if it, uh, John, I'm gonna feel free. If it gets unbearable, let me know. Sure. sure. I might need to. I might need to switch internet connections, but gotcha. we'll let it. We'll let it ride for a minute here. Okay, two middle blocker attacks right in the right in a row for Lewis. That was what was working for him in, in night one. They're going right back to it tonight too. Still pixely, or how we doing? Yeah, it's a little tough, Matt. Okay, all right. I'm gonna pause for a second here. Let me uh, stop a share. Try this again. While I'm closing apps down to try and make this as smooth as possible. The other thing, once we do get to a point where it's actually viewable, um, Lewis's bench is also an awesome, um, an awesome one to watch. They are super energetic. Uh, they do a ton of weird different stuff, but they're constantly engaged and they're constantly um, they're constantly giving support to their team. Um, so it's a, it's a fun one to watch. Broing. Yes, Calvin. <laughs> a little bit better. A little bit better? A little bit. <laughs> Let me see on my re does my rewind hurt it as well? Let's see. About the same. Apologies for technical difficulties. All right. 
I'll pause right there. John, so unbearable that I should uh, switch my connections for a minute and hop off here, or is this sufficient enough that we're able to see what's it's, going on? Uh, it's pretty 8-bit. Um, it's a little bit hard to see the detail. Does that, everybody agree? You can unmute yourself. Okay, yeah. cool. I see some nodding. Yeah, it's totally right, so everyone stay patient for a minute. I'm going to switch my internet to something better here. I'll go on to my phone hotspot, but I'm going to log off for a minute. Coach John, share some knowledge while I'm out of here. Sure. You got it. All right. Guys, so um, we're talking a little bit about um, uh, during the town hall yesterday regarding possibly doing Zoom sessions with, uh, you know, we'll try to fi figure out uh, if we want to do some Zoom sessions, maybe some national team players. I was thinking some beach players. Um, because I like beach. Let me turn on my video here. But anybody unmute yourself if you want, uh, turn on your video. And uh, maybe you have some thoughts. Have you guys seen anybody that's doing Zoom sessions or Q and A's or clinics uh, for other clubs on Instagram or anything like that? Um, the encore with the Shoji brothers is actually pretty interesting because it's just like talking through like all of their experiences with volleyball. Um, I think Dustin Watt has done a few for some clubs in the area too. So yeah, that's right, the libero, right, for the national team. Yeah, I think uh, Coach Matt was talking about Dustin and how he's uh, in competition with Kyle D'Agostino from uh, from Stanford as well. So uh, some loyalties, some loyalties there with 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 Coach Matt to to Kyle. So um, yeah, I was thinking I saw a couple of beach guys and these guys would transition from indoor to beach, and so. I personally, I was looking towards, uh, I don't know if you guys like him, but Mr. Swab Hawk, uh, don't pull on me, Casey Patterson. Um, I've heard a couple of uh, interviews that he's done online with, with, with clubs. And so I thought it might be cool if we got kind of, he played at BYU for, I think it was three years or something like that. And he transitioned to the beach. So that may be, might be kind of cool. I saw Troy Field. Um, some of you guys who went down south, uh, during the summer, I think you guys got to go like Long Beach State and uh, I don't know, national championship stuff and head over to the AVP tournament. You got to meet Troy Field, I think. So Troy Field's doing some stuff. Um, anybody else? The, the Soji brothers, I saw that encore thing. That was really cool seeing um, the two kind of different positions, right? One of them playing libero, one of them playing setter. One's a starter, one's kind of the, the backup. But that was really cool. So that might be a might might be an option too. Um, but yeah, feel free to uh, send them over to Coach Matt if you guys have any suggestions. Or um, uh, I'm doing some research this weekend, um, and so if you guys have any suggestions, let us know. Send it over to the to the Beta Bay email, and uh, I'll see who we can get on. You know, possibly get online for a Zoom session. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, good segue. I'm back, by the way. Yeah. Sindhu already uh, reached out to Eric Shoji and oh. got him to mess message him back and said to have us get in contact with him. So, Coach John, I'll, I'll, forward, you the, I'll forward you the information. Oh, man, I got goosebumps. Um, now. That's awesome. Cool stuff. This looks um, good. All right. This look better for everyone? Way better. See, how, see yeah. how this goes. I'm going to play it. How are we looking? Paused. Okay, now it pixelated again. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Come with some slack here, Zoom. I'll take a screenshot for you, Matt, so you can see what it looks like. All right, well, since all you can see is pixels, I'll do my best to explain this match. Couple, couple things that you, you may not be able to notice off the details. The middle blocker that's in for Stanford right now is uh, a true freshman. Okay, so that's, uh, that's Nathaniel Gates. He had not played in a single match uh, all year besides like uh, the preseason NIA match against Menlo and stuff like that. Um, so he's a true freshman coming in. Kyler Presho actually sprained his ankle at the very end of um, the, mat the first match against Lewis the, the night prior. Uh, and so he's a freshman coming in to try and, try and make something happen. Lewis, I think, was ranked number six currently uh, when we were playing them here. 
Um, and so it was a pretty cool little moment to see him get in and, and, you know, try and make some things happen. He wasn't the, you know, wasn't a world leader, but he did a really good job throughout this match of just doing what was expected of him and, and, and holding his own and, and showing kind of why he was a highly, you know, he was a highly recruited player coming out of high school, but, um, you know, taking that jump from high school to college still, no matter what, is a, is a big step. So that was a good one. Yeah, it's even getting pixelated on my end now. Mm -hmm. All right, well, for that reason, we're just gonna have to scrap this current format as it is and we're gonna go to something else. So since we can't do much of the video per se, what I will do is stop this share for a second and hopefully we can come to something better here. Go ahead and on or show your videos for me and we'll have a little, uh, we'll have a little discussion. Do the best we can for, for strategy wise. See who we got. Okay, I got a couple middles in here, that's good. Mr. Pinkston as well, all right. Good, okay. All right, so the, the things that I was gonna go over in this match that show is Stanford actually in this first set comes out really strong and jumps on, um, jumps on Lewis. They end up kind of taking like a nine point lead uh, and they hold that through through the first set. So they came out firing. Right. And so it's a unique experience and it's not really something that we as club volleyball players get a lot. Even as high school players, you don't get this opportunity a lot where you're playing the same opponent back to back. Right. And so that's a, that's a rarity in college as well. Does anyone know what schools have that advantage? What schools get to play their opponents back to back two nights, double headers for the most part. Anyone know? I think Hawaii does it pretty frequently correct yeah who else hawaii and that gives you an example right hawaii is on an island so you're not going to fly out to hawaii and play them for one match and then fly home right so you get to most every team is going to do a double header with hawaii okay what other teams do you think have that that advantage as well think of teams that are not located near other volleyball teams think the top team in the country this past year anyone know who the number one which team which team finished number one in the ABCA poll this past past year obviously no national champion because everything got stopped but ranking wise Edis, yes you unmuted yourself um I thought it was Hawaii but I guess not that might have been second Hawaii was number one going into the final weekend in oh, which okay. they played BYU, oh, and BYU. They, lost, they lost to BYU all right, so BYU and Provo, Utah, also no other collegiate program around them. So those two programs, along with a couple, a uh, couple others, um, but those are the, the main ones that I want you guys to know about. They'd have a different mentality when it comes for game planning against teams, right? And so this, this was an example for Stanford where we're playing against Lewis. Lewis is from Romeoville, Illinois. Um, and so they're out on a West coast swing. They're going to get two matches rather than just playing us once. So they've got two matches where we're preparing for each other. And there's a lot that goes into the balance of after you played your first match, how are you making those little adjustments, right? So normally for Stanford, for example, we'll go down to Southern California, we'll play UCLA, and then we'll play Pepperdine, right? Or then we'll do, you know, we'll do USC, and then we'll do Concordia Irvine. So we're playing two different teams. And so throughout a week, when you're preparing, you have to game plan for two separate teams, and you're trying to keep those straight. And it could be different strategies. It could be different defensive setups that you're going to do against an opponent. When you get to focus on one, that's when things get really interesting, right? And how do you guys think that relates to what we do for club volleyball? In thinking about those two different, uh, two different mentalities, how does that relate to what we do, um, whether it's Northern California regional play or if we're going to junior nationals? Anyone? Anyone think of an example of, of how those two different preparation styles come into play, right? Where you're thinking about one opponent, one opponent, you know, big picture, really get into the details. And then number two, when you're thinking about multiple teams at once. Anyone can unmute themselves. 
Um, I mean, like for power league, like you know what teams you're going to be going up against. Like, if like I mean, it's, the brackets like are pretty consistent throughout the season, so like you know what teams you're going to be seeing. But then you get to nationals, and like a couple of days before you find out where you're seated, you play teams from across the country that you've never seen before. You've done other playing style, um, so it's just like a big change from like playing the same teams every other weekend for power league yeah for sure that's that's exactly the example I'm go, I, I would go over right when you think about ncva power league for the most part you guys are seeing a lot of the same teams right calvin and edis and uh, andrew you guys are seeing you know mountain view 14 ones every week every power league weekend you know for the 13s guys timmy and uh whoever alex guys like that you're you're seeing the same group in that gold bracket kind of over and over again and so you can have a really clear picture where you can take the mentality of the BYUs and the Hawaii's where, you know, during practice, you can be thinking about those opponents, right? You can be thinking about how did they beat us previously? How did we beat them previously? And you're playing that game of chess of, you know, what's the next move, right? What, what's the next step that we have to take um, to kind of move forward? When you think about junior nationals, kind of like what Neil was talking about is you, it's, it's a box of chocolates. You don't know what you're going to get until about five days out. Uh, and then for, for me as a coach, it's always kind of a mad scramble of just searching through YouTube to try and find teams that are silly enough to put, post their, all of their matches on public, you know, YouTube channels. And then we scout them that way uh, or using baller TV, which is, you know, a new thing as well that we've done. Um, so when you think about junior nationals uh, and we talked this about this actually pretty early on in, in one of the film Friday sessions, how would you go about scouting teams that you've never seen before? Let's just assume that there's no YouTube footage of any team. What's your, how do you go about scouting that team? I'm going to go to Landon. Landon, how would you go about scouting a team that you've never seen before? Um, I would probably look at um, who are the role players on the team. Okay. When, where, when and where would you, would you do that? Um, when watching them play. So when you got to the actual tournament? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's, that's the idea um, right there. If you have, if you can't find video of a, of a team, right. And you're not always going to be, you know, super proactive and searching to try and find footage. And that's no problem. Right. Just thinking about how you right? this game, this game that we play is, is a strategic game. It's not as much as it is about, you know, you, you need to control your side of the net. There's also things that you can, you can gather uh, and you can gain from just by watching your opponent and seeing their weaknesses. Right. So just like Landon said, like, I'm going to show up, I'm going to see who their role players are. Right. Even, you know, it happens all the time. Guys will, you're back there shagging during hitting lines and you're like, Hey, they're outside hitters, their go-to guy. And it looks like he likes line. Right. Yes. That's helpful. Um, but it's even more helpful to watch a team play in, in pool play, right? So if you're the one seed in a four-team pool uh, and you're waiting, you know, and, you, and you're trying to watch the other teams play, that first matchup, you play the one versus the three. So you may not have much information about the three seed. You're trying to gather what you can during hidden lines, but then you get to watch the two versus four and you get to see what that looks like, right? And we've all been in a pool where the poor tournament director seeds, you know, some Canadian team as the four seed in reality, they're like the top three team in the tournament. And now you're looking at those guys and you're trying to figure out um, what you can do to compete against that. All right. And so those, those are the things where I encourage you when you, when you get to a tournament, when you get to a competition style thing, any opportunity you get to, to gather some information and some Intel on your opponents is, is big. What things can you look for besides just who the, the role players are? Right. Besides the who the big hitter is. George. Uh, you can look for their weak spots as well. Give me an example of a weak spot. Uh, maybe their libero is a lot shorter than the rest of the team. So you could hit it higher and deeper over the libero. OK. All right. So maybe even like maybe even serving too. right. Try and get it on the libero's hands. Yeah. Right. If you see a smaller player and they may not have as much arm strength, try and get it up high on them. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Ryan Barnes, what else can you do? Uh, like you can uh, watch how they serve during their warm-ups. Like, Great example. Great example. Specifically for 12 and under volleyball, that is a fantastic example. Um, it's good for, for all of them. If you're a passer, 
during the, the one minute serving that teams take, that's your first chance to see like the serve that guys are going back trying to hit. You can see the spin before they hit it at you. And that's a huge thing. Um, so watching the different serves that are coming through, is there any guy that, you know, is the libero going back there and practicing popping in, you know, short area two float serves or some server sub guy that's coming off the net where that's his role. That game is to try and serve a ball short, right? You can call it out right when he subs in, Hey, watch the short ball right here or anything along those lines. Okay. That's great. Any other examples? You can see whether they're running a 5-1 or a 6-2. Okay. 5-1, 6-2. Yeah, that's a um, – that is for sure something you potentially could see, uh, depending, like, does their, does their set or set and then also hop into hitting lines or, you know, things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, um, that's a good example also. And the last one I would kind of say as well is just watch – you can watch, like, the, who the role players are, the big hitters. Um, per se, but also just watching what shot do they like to hit, right? If you're a blocker, think, you know, if I'm the setter and I see the outside going up and he's just, you know, trying to bounce line the whole time, first block move I make, I'm going to say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and get out there, take his line uh, and, and jet this guy early. So that's another example as well. Okay. As you get into a game, how can you start to progress, right? We talk about that example of like, you've got, you've got, two matches that you've, you know, you're looking at a team and you're going to spend a lot of time on them. How do you start to make adjustments on the fly as a player and as a team? Calvin, give me an example of how can you, how can 14 premier make adjustments on the fly when you guys are playing? Um, like if I, if I set the middle and then like, um, they're double blocking, then like, you know, that like, you can like, like set them and tell your middle to like tip to that side. That's more open. Yeah, that's a great example, for sure. Um, that's a that's another example as well. Aaron, I'm gonna come to you also. Uh, that's an example as well for for middles in general. Is if you get if a middle ever gets double blocked, you should be telling your setter right away after the point, right? Uh, same thing for middle. If you're a middle that's on the on the sideline, say you're the middle that's off, and you see that happen, right? You should be letting him know. Or if you see a commit block, right? Hey, he just committed on you know he just committed on Edis right there, right? And that lets the that lets the setter know okay, my pins are open up and we'll have one-on-ones. Aaron, how about you? What was your thought? Well, like sometimes if you can find a player who like either gets mad at himself or like gets annoyed, you can kind of like target him, and, like kind of yeah. feel bad about himself and like kind of make him play worse because he's not focused. The, the classic find the head case maneuver. Yeah, I like that. Very good. Um, okay. What other things on the fly? Aaron, go ahead. Yeah. I think you can also tell a little bit about their blocking. Like if they're not penetrating at all, like how can you use that to your advantage? Because there's a lot of errors I make sometimes that the team can pick up on. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's for sure a good one. Um, I'm planning on going uh, another 10 or so minutes here. I'll, I'll try the video one more time just to see if we can get something out of it if internet works well. But um, I'm going to call on some people as well here um, to just give me, to give me an example. When you're thinking about making adjustments in the game, we can think about the opponent for sure. Um, but we can also think about ourselves, right? So Nathan, Nathan, Adamia, how can you talk to your team to make in-game adjustments? Um, I think like maybe, our team may be caught up in like the middle of the match. So we're like a little pin heavy. We're just setting our pins all day. Might like switch it up, go to the middle or go back row or something like that. Okay. How would you communicate that? Cause that's a good, that's a, that is a good example, but it's also one of those ones where sometimes can be a little bit touchy, right? Where, you know, coaches might say, Hey, like don't tell your setters what to run uh, or, you know, anything along those lines. How would you, how would you go about broaching that subject? Uh, during a timeout, <laughs> that works. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think the the thing that I'll probably try and get an example of would be, uh, Edis, yeah, let's see what your thought is on that. 
Um, I was just going to say um, an example for me that I know um, has like happened a lot. It's like me and Calvin are constantly talking, or me and Luke, let's say just the setter in general, we're constantly talking um, on like sets. And also like if Calvin notices an area that I should hit, that he sees is open, that I could, that um, like he sees a fault in like where I'm hitting, he'll tell me if the set's low, we'll communicate. Or if it's too fast and we're running a three, then just constantly um, communicating after every single set to find what works. And afterwards, just um, working together to just rack up points. Yeah, that's great. That's great, right? A lot of communication between, uh, between you and the center, specifically as a middle blocker, is important. Pins, does anyone remember at pin hitters practice, we, we set the rule um, for when you can communicate to your setter. When can you communicate to your setter about like you needing something different? whether it be pushing it out or getting it off the net or go ahead, George. Uh, in between plays. Okay. Yeah. In between plays would be correct. But what's the specific rule? When are you not allowed to go up to your setter and ask for something different? We'll After you completely that. miss a hit. Yeah, exactly. Benjamin. Right. If you make an error and you run up to your setter and you're like, dude, set me higher just a bad luck, right? That's just, that's just what, that's just us kind of making a, making an excuse or, or trying to, you know, shift blame off of ourselves. Right? If, even if the setter, the setter knows if they've made a bad set or a tough set, right? You don't need to go up and be like, dude, don't double the ball. Like, yeah, obviously. Same thing goes for setters, like setters pass the ball right here. Like, yeah, obviously we're trying to get the ball in the net. We all, those are the types of things that aren't super productive, um, but happen all the time, right? Cause it's easy to try and shift blame or, or, you know, think of it and think of it in the sense that it's not your fault and you're doing your best. If you ever make a mistake, like we always talk about at pin hitters, I always say, hey, if you hit the ball out of bounds, your only thing to say is my bad. I got to keep that ball in play. And then next time when you get a bad set and you just recycle it or you tip it into a, you know, tip it onto the setter and take him out, you talk after the point, be like, hey, let's pu just push me out a little bit further on that one. If you can get me to the line, like I can get a kill here. Right. Those are those are things that are, are positive and can build each other up, and you can make adjustments on the fly. On um, it, no one, no one likes Mister Set Me Higher, Push It Out, this that. No matter what, when they're raking the ball into the net or just you know doing their own thing. Right, so those are important ones as well. Okay, um, I'm going to continue on my uh, picking on people, not picking, just calling upon people. Let's go to is that Caden Mays? Which Caden is this? Caden. It's Caden Mays. Hi. Okay. All right, Caden. What's how can you adjust on the fly? You're uh, as well a middle blocker. How can you guys adjust on the fly as a team? Uh, we just try to look where we're getting beat at. Like if we're always getting beat, like on the antenna, then we'll do we'll, like blockers are just constantly talking. Like push out to the antenna a little bit more. Just try to cover everything. Yeah, that's a that's another really really good example, right? If one guy's beating your team over and over again. Right, you want to know where that player is, right? So if it's if there's a pin hitter that's just kind of you know it's having a good game and it's hitting pretty efficiently, then all right, middle blockers, maybe you're saying, hey, get ready, I'm going to start pushing out to to get a double block up on this guy. All right, you're communicating with your left side blocker, hey, help with the middle here, I'm getting ready to push out. I'm running. Maybe your coach calls a trap block scheme or things like that. Um, those are good adjustments that can be made on the fly. All right, we're going to try uh, we're going to try video one more time here, and if not, I've got one more little question that I can pose to you all to see um, a little conversation. So let's check this out and see if this uh, does any better. Coach John, you give me the honest, honest feedback of where it's at. All right. Got it. How was that? Can we see it? Uh, not yet. Oh, really? Jeez. It says you started sharing, but uh, we don't see anything yet. Okay. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna share again. And let me let me know when it appears for you, and then I'll click play. I see it, but it's really pixelated. All right, we'll play one point, and then we'll yeah. go to my last. We'll go to my last question if it stays pixelated. Okay. Yay, nay. It's not moving. Okay. <laughs> he doesn't want to cooperate today. All right. I'm sorry for the 
I'm sorry for the poor video today, gentlemen. All right, but my last question, and this was this was a good one for Lewis, and you can't you can't see it because it's pixelated. But Lewis's bench is big, it's rowdy, it's a lot of fun. Um, they're engaged. Obviously, no one wants to sit on the bench. I get that. Um, what lessons do you think you can take away from seeing a bench at a collegiate level program that's bringing a ton of energy? Um, what what do you what benefits do you see from that? Because I think there's some easy, obvious, you know, cherry pick answers of like what's beneficial of having a high energy bench. Um, but I want to dig a little bit deeper because all of us have been on the bench at some point. Edis, yeah, go ahead, give me one. Um, like, not only are you motivating the other people, but you're also like um, giving energy to yourself because no one, because like you said, no one likes being on the bench. And when you're all um, together on the bench and like cheering your team on, it's a good feeling and it really uplifts everyone, people on the court, off the court, coaches, everyone that's, that's um, playing. Yeah, uh, obviously that's the simple cherry pick answer, right? Of it just, it brings energy. It's, it shows your teammates that you're invested, that you're engaged. Um, I, even more importantly, I think it shows your coach as well. Um, if, you're, if you're on the chat, you can throw on your video, throw on your video. Um, I'll give a, a personal antidote here. When I first went, I went to University of Pacific back when they had a Division I program. They cut it in 2014, was the final year of the program. I graduated in 2013. When I first got there, I was a freshman, and I was just trying to do whatever I could to, to make the travel team. Travel team was like 14 guys. Uh, we played in the MPSF, which was at the time just – it was every team on the West Coast before the Big West broke off, and then, you know, all the Stanford, UCLA's, all the teams that are already in the MPSF. So it was just an absolutely brutal league. Um, and there was, at the time, I think like six pins on the roster, and we had uh, two liberos. And one of the liberos actually ended up quitting like before the season started. Uh, and so I just went hard as hell to try and become the second libero because I wanted to travel. I wanted to get the experience of, of going with the team uh, and, and seeing what that was like. Uh, and it was a lot of time on the bench, right? And I, I carved out a role as a serving sub as a freshman. That was, that was the best that I could have hoped for um, and, and got to try and do whatever I could to just find some kind of experience on the court. Um, lessons that can be learned from that, I, I, would, I would equate the University of the Pacific bench to a lot like the Lewis bench. A little bit kind of like, Kind of a holish, kind of you know, kind of a holish. We were not the most talented of, of men's volleyball teams, um, and so we had to bring energy and, and get under guys' skins as best we could to try and do some stuff. Um, we had a lot of fun, um, but I think the biggest thing that I took away from it is my coach always knew who was ready, right? And as much as it sucks to kind of play cheerleader on the sidelines, um, I know I I know that my teammates appreciated that getting an energy from me and everyone else on the sidelines. Uh, and I know my coaches did as well. Um, and I think that played a big part of, if you think about how, you know, thinking about your scenario, wherever you guys are at currently, right. You can think about your Bay to Bay teams. You can think about your high school teams of where you are, you know, where you see yourself kind of fitting in. Right. And if you want to try and carve out more, right. Say you're on the bench, say you're on JV or you're on the freshman team and you're trying to, you're trying to work your way up so that, you know, you're sliding into that varsity program and then you're getting on the court for that varsity program. The biggest way that you guys can continue to do that and to continue to, to get more is to give more, right. When you're providing value, um, so much will come to you, right. It's not you asking for more, it's you giving more and showing the people who, who are involved that you're there, you're contributing, uh, you're bought in, and you're ready to go. Uh, and a lot of that is true for, for even business as well. Right? Some of the most successful businesses are businesses that just provide value, right? The top media outlets are outlets that are providing value to the people that are, that are, are watching and looking. Um, so if you can provide value in some way, um, that is a huge motivator and a huge step for you guys as players. And so much of it is not even just your skill, right? Yes, you need to provide value with your skills, right? Your setting, your passing, your hitting, all that good stuff. But if you can provide value in a lot of different ways, right? Ways that other guys aren't willing to do, that's just another thing that takes you a step above. Um, what do you guys think those are? What are the ways you can provide value? Just for, you know, besides from being a cheerleader and, and bringing a ton of positive energy and having fun on the sidelines, what other ways can you provide value? 
to your teammates, to yourself, to your coaches, um, all that good stuff. Because it goes to – this stuff goes to, like, college recruiting as well. Right, or how do you think you can provide value? How can you – how can you give more to your team? And we're not talking about playing. Nothing, no, no words about playing right now. I called on you, Ryder Madden. No, I can't hear you. Try and type it out. I can't hear you. I'm going to go to Alex Lee. How can you provide value? We'll stick with the 13-year-olds right now. You can, like, encourage them off and on the court. Say that again? Encourage encourage on and off the court? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, you're not off the hook yet. Yes, that is correct. You can encourage on and off the court. Take it deeper. What does that look like? Uh, cheering for every single point. Uh, yep. You cover that one. What else? Telling them, like, what to watch for. Great. Yeah, talking about going back to the, the scouting report idea. If you're on the sidelines and say you're the starting libero or you're the second – you're the libero that's not in right now, right? You can be looking for, hey, this guy, um, you know, in serve, receive, you know, our outside hitter, you know, whatever, whoever. You say Brian Pinkston's, hey, he's cheating a little bit to the left. Make sure you pull him back into the center of the court. Right, or he's getting a little too sucked in on defense. Make sure you're, you're telling him to stay back and stay disciplined. Right? You can be looking for things to help that player communicate, uh, showing that you're engaged and staying on top of it. And as well, if your number's called, which it very well could be, you're stepping in and you can then say it. Okay? Uh, Julian, how else can you provide value? Uh, you could, like, cheer every time your team gets a kill. And, like yeah. – we like, covered cheering. We've I'll got like cheering. Everyone, everyone can cheer. What else? What besides cheering? We all know we can cheer. We can be cheerleaders. What else can we do to provide value? Clapping. Clapping. <laughs> I would put that under the cheering category. Ryder typed in his answer. Calling the ball in and out. Great. That's a good one. Yeah. Noah, go to you. You can be, like, pushing your teammates harder at practice, and then that way everyone's getting yeah. better. Great. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing you all – I want all of you to take away from this is the majority of this stuff, the providing value, is going to come practice. Right, yes, being a cheerleader at a game, being energized, being focused, calling the ball in and out, you know, and just showing that you're engaged during the match – is, is hugely important, especially at club tournaments where you're playing six matches, and that's not always the easiest thing to do if you're off for, you know, one or two matches. Um, in practice is where the easiest time to show value, right, to provide more, to give to your teammates. So how can we give? How can we give at practice besides just, you know, competing your ass off to try and, you know, beat out the guy that who's ahead of you or push your teammates to try and be better? What else can we do? Ryan Bombs, what can you do to provide value at practice? You can, like, uh, help your teammates out on, like, if they're doing something wrong, like, correct them practically, I guess. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can, you can, you can I, I would always advise to help, right? If, if, you, if you see an opportunity to help, try and do that. There's always a fine line to walk when, like you don't want to come across as trying to coach your teammates specifically as a coach. That's always one of my pet peeves. Pet peeves is I'll do the coaching. You can do the encouraging, right. To try and encourage your teammates um, if they're struggling with something or if they need help, right. If you, if you see someone that needs a partner, uh, if you have an odd number, invite them in to do three man pepper instead, or be a, make a three man warm up or whatever you can, right. Always trying to help in that sense. George, I saw you go in for a, for a response there. What do you got? Uh, showing your investment on the court, off the court at practices, whether there's team meetings outside of practice. Uh, for example, there was a kid on my team uh, a few years ago uh, that didn't show that they cared. So they would come to games 
and they would be on the bench and they'd be complaining about, oh, why am I not playing? Why am I not playing? And you'd go to practice and you'd see him or lollygagging or just fooling around and you just think to yourself, well, that's why. But then there's other kids on the team that are fully invested, that completely care, and they're showing up for the, for the team sleepover and hanging out with everyone, including everyone, and just showing that they care. And they're getting playing time and getting kills, getting really good digs, stuff like that. Yeah, a good uh, kind of the, uh, the alternative example, right, the, the what not to do yeah. type of scenario. Sure. I think we, I think most everyone could probably nod their head and, and think of a player like that, um, that they've, they've dealt with or, or come across. And um, those aren't the easiest, right? Those definitely aren't the easiest of, of teammates to deal with. Um, there's a, there's another spectrum of that as well. Um, I, I, I think I told you guys is what we, we, we for Stanford, we've been doing a, a kind of like a kind of like a book club, but it's been for the Michael Jordan documentary that just finished, The Last Dance. Any of you guys watch that by a raise of hands? It's anyone watch any of the episodes of Last Dance? Anyone good? All right. Um, right. Michael Jordan, one of, if not the greatest basketball players of all time. Um, and he's kind of gotten some heat through this documentary of how he treated his teammates um, because he was an absolute, for lack of better words, a hard ass. He would get on them and he would do anything and any, everything to show that he was going to win, that he was going to drag them along if he needed to. Um, so much so that he, he punched Steve Kerr in the face during one practice. Steve Kerr, the current head coach of the Warriors, uh, played with Jordan when they were on the Bulls together. Um, literally punched him in the face because uh, his coach was calling some like what he called cupcake uh, cupcake fouls on him uh, and he got so mad that uh, they kept on calling these little fouls on him that he socked Steve Kerr in the face and then told his coach if you're gonna give me a foul I better deserve it and I deserve it for that one and then he got kicked out of practice um, obviously I am not telling you guys to punch people in the face but <laughs> Uh, afterwards he said, he's like, yeah, obviously that was wrong. And I went and I talked and I called Steve Kerr right away and we had a conversation and, you know, right away, we, we both, like, we both wanted to win. We both were super competitive uh, and Steve Kerr didn't back down to him there. Uh, but it just showed like the level of intensity that he was bringing um, with them. Um, but trying to can all expect teams to be cupcakes and rainbows all the time. And sometimes you'll get that, right? You'll get an experience where your team is awesome. Um, you really enjoy going to practice and you have a lot of fun. Um, but I think more often than not, there's going to be different personalities that you just don't vibe as well with. Uh, and especially at the highest level, there's, you know, there's a lot that, a lot that it takes to get to the point where you're super, super competitive. Um, so I think there's a lot of differing personalities. So there's a lot to be learned about how to deal with those. Um, even when, you know, it's, it's not the way that you would handle it trying to trying to find ways to bring those players into the fold is is probably one of the truest tests of a great leader um and i, I challenge all of you guys to think about that because it's it's probably prevalent on any team that you play with whether it be beta bay uh, or high school obviously at beta bay we we want to try and nip that in the bud as as best we can and, and be great examples but it's bound to happen right you're bound to have some people but that's life so cool that's my um that's my impromptu failure of a, uh, of a film Friday there. So I, I hope we at least got something out of it, talking about some different, different aspects. Um, hopefully we're able to, to watch that match at some point. I think there was a lot of good things to be taken away from it. Any closing thoughts or anyone have a, anyone have a, a, a thought that they wanted to share before I, uh, before I shut the meeting down. Coach John, did you have anything? Yeah, real quick. Uh, last night on a on course blue banner narrative, they had a, a, a women's player named Alohi Hardy. So she played over at BYU. Um, she played basketball and volleyball. She's now playing professionally in the Philippines, uh, playing volleyball. But she, she came into BYU and she was a, a bench player. So the term that she used and that helped her stay prepared was uh, bench energy. So they called it Benergy. And that was the first time I've been playing volleyball for a long time. And that's the first time I've heard that term, uh, Benergy. And so be sure 
you're you're showing your coach that you're engaged even if you're not in the on the in, in the game um one quick anecdote i heard some some college coaches talking about scouting and one of the things that they would do is when a, a starting player or the person they're scouting wasn't on the court they would watch and see how they interacted with their teammates when they weren't in the game so uh someone's always watching right someone's always watching so uh be sure you're engaged be sure you're helping your team be sure that you're providing that energy because uh, it's contagious, right? You said at UOP, you guys had a style about it. Uh, Long Beach State, the last two men's national championships, you see them out there doing that rowing thing and they're just fully engaged. Um, yeah, I, I, I hadn't heard that term before and uh, I'm going to, for sure, I'm going to be using that energy uh, uh, term with, with my team. So. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, players, any closing, any closing thoughts? I don't want to shut it down unless anyone had, if everyone, anyone had an example they wanted to share. Okay. All right. Otherwise, awesome stuff. Next week, uh, Wednesday, Outliers, chapters three and four. Uh, hop on. It's been a good book thus far, and I, I think uh, you guys would get a lot out of it if you're enjoying it. I, uh, I promise to be better next week. I'll, uh, I'll go kick my Wi-Fi router uh, in the back of the head, and hopefully that'll fix something. But uh, Until then, have a great weekend. Three day weekend. Have some fun. Thank you. See you guys later. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay.